<laughs> and uh, so I'm going to talk about today rich in faith. And I think it's important to understand that this whole chapter, these next two messages will be talking about faith because that's what Paul was relating to in this chapter 2 of James. And um, I want to talk a little bit about Paul's point of view on that and how, how he himself found um, Jesus alive and, and how he expressed himself as a, as a brother of Jesus. Let's just pray because I feel like I need everybody's attention here and we just need to focus and get excited. Lord, I thank you for this day. And Lord, I thank you that you are the God of all things. And Holy Spirit, have your way in this place. Allow your spirit to move in this place. Allow the word to come alive to our hearts so that we can see and move in it. In Jesus' mighty name, amen? Amen? <laughs> I need a little more help than that. You guys know me by now. Yeah. A good service is when everybody else is involved. That, that's the best service you can have. It's when we all get involved in it. And so I want to talk about a little about rich in faith. And I believe sometimes we don't understand what we have. And sometimes I believe that, that we actually deny our faith, not, without, not literally or not wanting to, but somehow we kind of ignore the faith that was put into us and the very power that is in us when we believe. The power after, that comes after walking in faith, the power that comes from the belief system of Jesus Christ, we often forget about that power. And I think sometimes we forget when we actually commit ourselves to the faith that how much we can actually see life change and how much impossible things we can see happen so that the, the impossible become possible if we just walk in faith. And I think we can see more than we ever have. So in James chapter 2, verse 1 to 4, follow on you version. I would encourage you to because I, I, I do a lot of work that if you're not following that, let me know because I'm going to stop doing that because that's work. <laughs> and so if you follow along, take your phones along, download the Bible app, and take your notes there, and disagree on your notes if you want, and all kinds of stuff. You have the ability to do all things on your phone. And so do it. Do, get your thought pattern flowing, because when our thought pattern flows, then God moves, because then we can connect deeper than we ever have. Amen? So I encourage you to follow that. Unless if you follow with your own Bible, that's good too. That's fine. But let, let's really... Let's have, make this the year where we actually look at it for ourselves. So if you don't do it now, take it down. And let's make this the year saying, well, Pastor George spoke on James chapter 2 to 1 to 4. And, and I just trust that what he said because he doesn't always say things right, but I kind of got what he said. But maybe if you read it yourself, you'll get the whole story better because it's in your heart. And so I would encourage you to, to make, make an effort of, uh, of reading what we read so that we can connect together in a deeper way this year than ever before. Amen? Yeah, it's, it's an awesome thing to be together. So James chapter 2, 1 to 4, my brothers and sisters, when we talk about brothers in King James, and we have to understand that because uh, what, what's going around to, uh, today, and which I understand what's going around, but it can become a place of bias, but it's not bias because it was in the time that the Bible was written where, where King James was perfect. They, they didn't have that freedom yet to write sisters down. But when you study in Greek, they were preferring to the whole church. They were preferring to sisters. So, so when, when we read King James or we read the Bible, just understand that the new translation is actually, I'm going to tell you another translation, they say brothers and sisters. So you have to understand it really meant that. So when I read King James, so you know that just because I don't say it every time, I mean that. That's my heart. My heart is, is for all the people. Amen? Amen. Say, I'm not offended. That's good. At least one isn't perfect. We'll move on. One is enough to work with. <laughs> But let's walk in the fullness of God's word instead of being nitpicking about it. And so I just say that because I don't know why, because I felt I should. Either way, because I read a lot of King James, I guess. That's why I'm saying it. And so, or the, uh, the WEB, the World English Bible does the same thing, and so does the New King James, so forth. So my brothers, don't hold the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ of the glory with partiality, which means the respects of a person. So my, my brothers, don't hold, don't, the sense of wearing, don't wear your faith in the respects of a person. Don't hold your faith based on somebody else's opinion or based on circumstances. Don't hold your faith in that. And this is what God version would say, and it's, it's the same words as my brothers and sisters, practice your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ by not favoring one person over the other. So when we practice 
our faith, not partiality, but we practice our faith and we allow this gift that is within us, everything that's within us, to actually be part of everything, to be part of everybody, amen? So that I'm not, I'm not withholding uh, uh, from this side of the church compared to this side of the church, right? I'm giving you the same that's within me. Okay, I kind of have a hard time with this person today, so we're going here. That's being partiality, right? It's, it's, I'm not allowing God to use me because of my own opinion, right? And so when we remove the opinion of our own personality and we allow faith to flow in Christ Jesus the way it's meant to be, now it doesn't matter what you did to me, I'm the, I'm the vessel of God, amen? And, and I become that person where, where, where I'm not favoring no more, but when I'm up here, when I'm doing what God's called me to do, I'm giving everybody equal attention, amen? So now we don't become judgmental, but we become merciful in what God is doing, amen? And so, so we have to look past that, and I think as a church, as a, as a believer, we need to look past the, the opinion of a person. Not saying that we don't listen to the opinion of a person, but look past that to not interrupt what God is doing, amen? Amen. And so we go, brothers and sisters, like don't, don't favor and so when you look at that scripture in, in 1 Timothy 1, 19, it says, Holy faith and good conscience, which is having put away concerning faith, having made shipwreck. The biggest thing is we need to hold our faith so we don't become shipwrecked. Amen? How many in life, if, if we were just honest church today, which we always are, of course, um, if we were just honest church today, how many would you dare to say that I've been shipwrecked once before? I would dare to say that. And some of you maybe are in a shipwreck. Maybe you're like Paul and you're holding on that last piece of ship and you're hoping to get to shore. <laughs> Maybe you are that person. But God says to Paul, he says, you are not going to die. And he's saying to you, you're not going to die even if you're in the middle of your shipwreck. You're not going to die. You Hang on. Hang on to what I've given you. Maybe you only got a piece of the boat left. But I'm telling you, there is a remodeling happening on shore. And when you reach shore, there is a remodeling happening. And you're going to see the glory of God. And you're going to see the purpose of what you've been through. And you're going to see God move through that. That was a prophetic word. That was not in my notes. Then again, I don't make notes. But God is moving. Amen. I, I feel there's a word here saying that I don't know how to deal with my shipwreck. I don't know how to deal with my circumstance now. I don't even know how to overcome this right now. I feel like I'm drowning in all ways and I'm just hanging on to some truth and some hope. But in the meantime, I'm sitting in this water guilty. I'm feeling ashamed that I didn't hear God before or whatever. We, we judge ourselves. And God says, no, don't, don't, don't make, hold on to your faith with good conscience. Don't put away your faith with a shipwreck. Amen? How many believe, and I believe, today, this world, we have... Uh, we, we have seen people put their belief system away and they shipwrecked it because of opinions and, and tolerations and, and all kinds of battles that are going on and, and the, the claims that are going on and we have shipwrecked what we believed based on favoring people. Favoring opinions. And God says, don't do that. Remove yourself from that. Live in me and do not favor one another. Amen? So this means you can't go against the people that you hate. This means you can't go against what you disbelieve in, but you have to represent faith in those areas. Amen? This means you have to represent Jesus in the areas that you don't have agreement on. Amen? So we've got to walk in this place today. And, and I don't want to be shipwrecked. I've been shipwrecked before. I've been shipwrecked majorly. I thank God for his freedom. I thank God that I never had the, even the inkling or a thought of letting go of his faith. I mean, that would be the last, that was the last thing on my mind. I would have never even thought of that. The only thing that got me through my circumstances, my divorce, my, all the things that I didn't hand to myself, but they were there, only way I got through is through faith and through good people around me that supported me no matter what. Amen? I'm not saying you should get divorced. I don't believe that a person should get divorced, but sometimes it happens. Same. You know what I mean, right? And sometimes you have to deal with what's happening. And you have to put that sinful nature out of the way and put God back into it. Amen? And you've got to move forward. And you've got to move forward from that shipwreck that you're in right now. You've got to move forward. Amen? Verse 2, it says, For if a man... This is talking about 
a good example of how we favor people. And we shouldn't favor people, but it's sometimes this, this example, it's very hard not to favor people. I'm telling you. It says, for if a man with a gold ring and fine clothing comes in your synagogue or your church, and a poor man with filthy clothing comes in also in, <laughs> and you pay special attention to the one that wears fine clothing and say, sit here at this place, and the poor man stand there or sit at the footstool. If I was honest with everybody today, it's easier as a human to represent something that looks fine. Wouldn't you agree? And something that dirty clothes, they, that bugs me. But God says, don't favor those people. Paul, uh, James was looking here and saying that there's a problem here with your faith if you're favoring. Your faith. See, the thing is, what would happen in this incident if I would not favor that if I would engage into the rich and the poor as the same or, or the, the fine clothing and the not so fine clothing if I would if I would just put extra perfume around me for that moment or something to, and deal with the situations that are at hand right like the fragrance of God allow it to work in your life so that you can move forward but when you give attention with your faith, and you allow your faith to shine on the people that you feel don't deserve it. And when you do that, those people will change with you. Because there's something with God's faith, when it hits into people, and when it connects to people, people, people change in that faith. Amen? Soon you can have both people wear fine clothing, maybe in different standards, but both fine clothing, right? Soon you can have people that, and soon, soon the church can support when somebody's poor, soon the, oh, there's so much involved when you pay attention, you can change somebody's life forever just by allowing your faith to shine upon them. Amen? How much would you want to do that? I, I, I don't want to leave the rich out. See, the thing is, what we do is that, oh my goodness, if I can get that rich guy to stay in this church, <laughs> financial freedom, woohoo! But that's the wrong thinking. Because faith should not be favoring people. That's what James was talking about. And we need to start saying, God, what are we inviting in? And are we still a church that wants to see people change? Are we still a church that wants to see people healed? Are we, still, are we a church that still wants to see people finance breakthroughs? Do we want to see prosperity in the poor? Do we, are we that kind of people still? Or are we the people that ignore the people that actually need our faith to move forward? Amen? Are you with me? And so this is a... James is talking about it, and I think he learned a lot from Jesus. In verse 4 it says, Haven't you shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with e evil thoughts? When we do that, James said, Haven't you become partiality? This word, haven't you separated something? Have you, dis have you discriminated? That's what it means. Have you discriminated? And the Bible actually talks about you shouldn't discriminate, and we do that all the time as human nature. And it says, don't discriminate that. Don't, don't, don't judge that party compared to that party. Bring what you have to the table and allow God to do work. Amen? Our opinions hurt people because when we, when we believe somebody does something so wrong, we, we fight against it with our words. And, and it says, don't be, that's a judgment. He says, don't judge. Don't be that judge. And the says, and he becomes a judge with evil, which means hardships. How many know it's, and, and thoughts and reasoning, we start reasoning, we start, we start thinking about, man, this guy should just change, or this girl should just change, and we don't know the backstory. And, and we, we start judging evil because of the hardships they're going through. We, we, we start judging the hearts because of what we see. And the Lord says, James was talking about here, saying that, and, and we start reasoning that it's okay. We start reasoning things. And today, I want us to encourage us today, as soon as we walk in faith, we walk in the fear of people. As soon as we don't walk in faith, sorry, we walk in the fear of people and we rely on them. I think today's day and if I'm wrong, I don't think I'm wrong. I think Christians are walking in the fear of people. And we are, re, 
we are doing things based on the fear of the hearsay out there or in here, wherever it is, or with our family or whatever. We're, we're, we're fearful of, of people's opinions. So we treat the ones that feel that they need to be treated well instead of the ones that do, and we, we treat them differently. So we, we live in the fear of people because we, we choose not to walk in faith anymore, but we, talk, we, we, we choose to walk in, in the peace that the world offers instead of the peace that Jesus offers. Are you with me still? I think it will make sense when we get further. I think it makes sense. I think I'm a good preacher. I think it's making sense. Are you, are you making sense so far? Yeah, that's good. I'm not accusing. I'm preparing us to walk daily with Jesus. I really am preparing us to, to, to relook at what we're doing. If we're doing it good, then let's just improve it. But relook at it. Refocus. It's, it's time to validate us, or revalidate, or can't even pronounce the right words, but to look back at us and say, are we, are we still with Jesus? Are we still walking his path? Are we still in the righteousness? Are we, are we still in his faith? Or are we, are we letting go of it? That's what I'm challenging on these series. Is that we need to look back on it. Faith doesn't have the respect of persons. Meaning this, is that Jesus looks at everybody the same. He looks at the, 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 the pre-saved as saved. He looks at people that are saved as 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 heavenly, the kingdom of God. He looks at that. He looks at the same. Amen? Jesus doesn't matter what, what you agree with. It doesn't matter what politics you like or what you don't like. And it doesn't matter. He still looks at you the same with his love. Amen? He still looks at you with an opportunity. He still looks at you with a chance. He still looks at you with a place of freedom. There is always an opportunity to reach out. Amen? So he always looks at that and he says, so it's not perspective, it, it's your faith needs to represent yourself. And it can't, be, it can't be removed. We are so rich in something and we make ourselves so poor in it. I, I am so rich in faith. <laughs> I have so many memories of when I became born again and more memories of when I became spirit-filled. Going to the church and in the 90s, <laughs> charismatic movement going on. Oh, hallelujah. Like, it was just like that. These Bibles, we didn't have cell phones yet, and we didn't have Bible apps on our phones yet in, 19, in the mid-90s. And we're walking around with these things. And I had a bigger Bible back then because I wanted it to look a little holier. But you have these Bibles around, and you walk into restaurants, and you sit down, order your coffee, open it up, and start talking about what the pastor talked about. I remember the faith that we were so hungry for more of God. We were so hungry that we wanted to see Jesus move. We we're so hungry we wanted to see people saved. We were so hungry we wanted to see people healed. We were so hungry, God. And we were sitting there back and forth talking and so excited. And look at this, look at that, look at this, look at that. I'm not saying we have to go back to something that was old, but I think we need to go back to believing again and being hungry for him like we never had before. Amen? I'm not saying that you should go bring your big Bible in the restaurant and plump it on the table. But if, that feel, if you feel like it, go for it. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about living it more than showing it. Amen? That you become that walking Bible. That you become in that room and people see Jesus on you. Amen? But it's that excitement of Jesus that brought me to this point today. The excitement of my faith. People say, have you ever backslided? I, I don't think I ever have. I can't recall. Have I ever doubted Jesus? Yes. But it didn't last long. Maybe you all have doubted your health. Maybe you all doubted the promises of God. Maybe you doubted your faith. But it doesn't have to last long. You just got to go turn back to the living word of God and it will change you again. Amen? And that's why I want to encourage you to read your Bibles this year. <laughs> you know, confession time. I started a reading plan. I'm 12 days behind. So, so I'm, right now I'm doing two to three days a day just to catch up. But I'm determined that I'm going to catch up. Because I'm going to go through my whole Bible this year. Amen? <laughs> but you're so busy and, oh, shoot! And then you go, oh, man, I'm only three days behind. Twelve days? Hi, yi, yi, where have I been? I mean, I read my Bible. I just didn't do the reading plan. I mean, I've been studying, getting ready for this stuff. I've been busy. But I want to actually take more than what I'm studying. I want to have that personal time of just reading. Not really listening, but I, I follow along. 
I turn the on and put it in there and well, I'm just hearing these words, taking notes as I'm taking, taking scriptures down as, I'm, as the thing is reading to me. And, and, but I'm, I'm behind, I'm honest. Like, th see, the thing is, it's hard to create a habit to do a daily walk. It is so hard, isn't it? It is not the easiest thing in the world to do, is it? If you're trying to go through the Bible here, you actually have to go with it and you actually have to do what it takes to do it, amen? So our faith, got to get excited again. We've got to be excited to open the Word. We've got to get excited to hear more of God. Amen? Man, I, I thought this, I had it so simply done today. And I didn't turn my timer on, so you don't get to me on my 30-minute mark today. But it's okay. I haven't been on 30 minutes for the last four weeks. So. <laughs> been on 40, 45 minutes for the last four weeks. <laughs> But this is an important message. I believe this will set us for 2018, if not take us through 2018. And one thing cool about how I'm going, doing, going through James right now is that I'm always including different scriptures so that we're going through more than just James. But using James as a baseline of talking about these things. Amen? That's, I think it's good. Then if he goes in, in 2 Corinthians, and I believe often James must have thought about how Paul did and how Peter did and how those guys did because they all loved Jesus and they all served Jesus. The biggest thing to quote is Paul because Paul was a murderer of Christians and he got knocked off the high horse, which a lot of you guys need to be done. Sorry, I'm not talking to you with the video. <laughs> Video's there now. But anyway, um, we just need to be knocked down sometimes, right? And, and he, he was knocked down and, and he, his life was life-changing and he had an experience with Jesus that never changed him. And he was willing to sacrifice for Jesus. He was willing to die for him. He was willing to go to prison for him. So I believe James was saying, I, I need to quote uh, Paul a little bit because Paul went through a lot for the sake of Jesus Christ, my brother. Amen? And he went through a lot and he did not give up. And he was different than the rest because he was a Roman. He wasn't just a, a, the same as the disciples. He had different qualifications and he had different insights of people. Amen? They're all right, but he had an extra. And I think we all have an extra. We have insights that a lot of people don't have. And we need to start seeing that. Amen? Then in 2 Corinthians 8, 9, it says, For you now the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that through he was rich, yet for his sake became poor. For your sake, sorry, be, he became poor. That you through his poverty might be rich. <laughs> I, was, I was reading that and saying, My goodness, God, you already did the poorness for me. But you became poor so I could be rich. What are we complaining about? What, what, what are we doing wrong that we don't get this? Including myself. What are we doing wrong? What are we doing wrong that we don't get the riches of his faith in us? What are we doing wrong that when we seek him first and in righteousness, all things... What, what, what are we getting wrong? Why are we not getting it? Why are we not putting that in? How, why is it not grabbing hold of our heart? You know what I'm saying? It might not relate to you, but I'm going to pretend that it does, just so I can preach it. I think it does. If we really look deep inside, we all struggle with circumstances that we, if we were brave enough to say it, we would just say it, right? But we're Christians, so it's hard to say it because we're supposed to have all things, and we don't sometimes. It feels like we don't have what it takes to win. But in the meantime, Jesus says we do. Amen? Hebrews 1.3 says, His Son is the radiance of His glory. His Son, Jesus, is the radiance of His glory. The very image of His substance. Meaning if we follow Jesus, if we bring Jesus back alive, if we brought, come back into His faith, it will bring the radiance of God alive again. Amen? His radiance, our faith needs to rise up. His radiance and His image of His substance and upholding the things of the word of his power when he had by himself made purifications for our sins sat down on the right hand of God sorry right hand of the mercy majesty most high I'm not reading right sorry I apologize sat down on the right hand of the majesty of most high isn't that kind of cool that Jesus came and he represent faith and he gave it into our hands 
and he entrusted us so that he could go sit on the right hand of God and allow the spirit to move on this earth. Amen? He gave it into our hands. We are so rich in it. I think, I think we become porkers. Let me explain. <laughs> That's totally wrong. We're sitting around and we're becoming fat in the very thing we have, but we don't utilize what we have. We're spiritual coach potatoes sometimes. I was talking to my nephew yesterday. He was, we're talking about weights. We're talking about exercise. We're talking about this. And I said, I just have one problem. Is that my stomach comes in handy. It's when you sit on the couch and you lean back, it's a good remote holder. It's a good phone holder. It's a good soup bowl holder. It's a good ice cream bowl holder. So I was <laughs> telling him this time. I said, I have a six pack. I'm just coming up with my coffee table. But that's how we are Christians. Like we're so comfortable because we have everything handed to us almost, you know. We, we, we don't uh, exercise my topic because I, I'm trying to do some of that. But, but, but I thought about the idea of this. Is that how often don't we use our stomach as our support? At least I do. I have this little thing going on here. And, um, I, and so I was trying to explain to him. And <laughs> almost persuaded him being fat is okay. But... <laughs> But he, but he won over. He said, no, I can do it different ways. You're right. You can do it different ways. You just have to use your arms more than I do. That's all. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever done it. I don't know if you have a stomach like mine, but you sit down and watch a little show. It's nice and close. You put your phone up. You prop it up. And, and so the idea of this is we're doing that as Christianities. We, we, we are not taking his exercise seriously. We are not taking the spirit seriously no more the way we should. We're not taking our faith seriously no more. And we're making excuses. Like I make excuses about my weight. We make excuses and we justify that it's okay because it can be utilized this way. We need to start exercising the faith again. Amen? And we need to walk in that faith so that we become strong in that faith. So we become lean, that ready to move. Amen? One thing about the Roman soldiers, the biggest thing they had to win was the, the oil and, and their size. The, 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 there was no place to grab onto. They, 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 they oiled themselves up, which is the Holy Spirit today. They had that power. So when the enemies tried to grab that, it would slip off. That, that's the biggest power of the army. And we have the biggest power is our Holy Spirit. Because when we lead by the Holy Spirit, the enemy has not much to grab onto. Amen? Hallelujah. Verse 8 of chapter 2. However, if you fulfill the royal law, the kingly law, according to the scripture. This, I want to touch on this because we often, I hear a lot of talk on, on laws and all that. But let's open your ears on this one, okay, please? So that you pull from me right now because you might get saying, what are you talking about? Then you'll find out what I'm talking about, okay? Just grab a hold of this. However, if you are fulfilled by the royal or the kingly law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. But if you show partiality or you uh, discriminate, you, you commit sin. Did you know <laughs> when I saw that? It's when you, when you show partiality, you're actually committing sin. You're actually going off the mark. You're, you're missing the mark of Christ Jesus when you become, uh, you discriminate people. People say, well, he deserves it. No, it's not, your, it's not your job to say it's he deserves it or she deserves it. It's not, that's not your job to say. Your job to say he deserves the love of Jesus or she. Amen? It's actually a sin when you discriminate. And we are so much discriminating. Just go on Facebook for a while and look at your feeds for a while. You'll see it. Just doesn't take much. Doesn't take much. You'll find it anywhere. Just Google Google something, anything that's going on in the world right now. You'll see discrimination going on. Amen? It's not a good thing, but it is happening. So let's not be part of that sinful nature. Let's change the way we see the world. And let's be the one that brings the faith to the world. Amen? 
Let's bring the one that brings the love of Christ to the world. Amen? It says, love your neighbor as yourself. You'll do well. Don't show partiality. Don't discriminate. Don't, which is committed. Be, being convicted by law of the transgressor or the lawbreaker. Don't, you need to be convicted as a lawbreaker. In the spiritual law I'm talking about. You need to be convicted. Um, go keep on. For whoever keeps the whole law and stumbles is, in one point, he becomes guilty of all. So the thing is this, we got to, how many know it's hard not to be judgmental? Just raise your hand. Okay, don't raise your hand. <laughs> I knew that was going to happen. How many know it's hard not to be judgmental? It is, right? So there's a freedom here. He's saying, but if you break one law, it's like you broke all of them. Law is pretty stern. Law is pretty harsh, isn't it? But God gave us a way out of that harshness. I'm going to show you this scripture that's really cool. Is he gave that. Because if you break one law, it's like breaking all laws. So if you want to be a law follower, which is that Jesus fulfilled, if you want to go back to something that he fulfilled all the time, you're never ever going to be successful because you'll always be a law breaker. You can't be successful following the law. It's, not, it's, not, it's almost impossible. Like how many times, now honestly here, how many are you going 100 kilometer road and are going 102, 105, 110? We break law all the time, don't we? It's hard to keep law. For me, I, I, always, I always tell myself there must be at least a little bit of grace. So, there must be at least a 10 kilometer grace. Hallelujah. But, but really, I'm still breaking the law, right? I don't get necessary caught. And necessary people don't, when there's a fine line where we break the law, people don't always recognize it as breaking the law. They consider it stretching it maybe. But the fact is that you're still breaking the law. So it's hard to keep law, isn't it? Thank God there's a way out of this. Because if I break that law, it's like I break many laws. But anyway, let's just read. And, um, but if, if you live by law, you always live by consequences. I mean, there's always consequences. I'm not saying that you shouldn't have no laws, okay? I'm trying to get some here. There's a transformation that's going to happen on our judgment, how, how, how we see things and how we see law, okay? Let's go with this. Verse, uh, Matthew 5, 17 and 18 says, Do not think that I came to destroy the law but of the prophets or the prophets. I didn't come to destroy but to fulfill. But most certainly, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not even the smallest letter or one tiny pen stroke shall in any way pass away from the law until it has been accomplished. So how do we accomplish the law without being legalistic or religious. So let's walk into this place because there is a transformation that's going to happen here in the next scriptures here. In 13 and 17. Have mercy on them that, and do not discriminate. He says, for, ju for, certainly, for judgment is without mercy. When you go to there, there's no mercy. It's, it's based on the written law, right? So there's no mercy in that. So if you want to live by the law, there's no mercy on you. How many want a new law, which is a spiritual law? Amen? How many want the new law? Because the, the scripture applies to us, but we can look at it different because of Jesus Christ. Now, when we look at this, he says, for judgment is without mercy on him, and who's shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs judgment. So we have to know that whenever there's mercy, it overrules judgment. Amen? Mercy becomes your new judgment. Mercy becomes your new judgment. And when you live in that mercy, you, when you live in that faith, you start having mercy on the people that you think did wrong on you. You start having mercy on the people that have done wrong on you. You start having mercy on the sins around you. You start having mercy, and mercy can change the sin into a repentance or conviction. Amen? So when we look at that scripture, and it says in verse 5, Matthew 5, 7, it says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Meaning that if you don't want to live by law, or be judged by law, or you don't want to be, be uh, responsible for every law because you've broken one law, you've got to start living by mercy. Amen? I mean, you want to make life a little easier. Be merciful. Stop discriminating. Live in faith. And watch God move. Does it mean all those things? Does it mean that love your neighbor is wrong? No, no. It just means 
you got to love your neighbor by mercy instead of by judgment. you got, you got to change the word judgment to mercy, and mercy is the new judgment. Amen? Because mercy still looks at people and still sees the problems and still sees the sin, but mercy comes in with the love of Christ for the opportunity to change it. Amen? It gives them opportunity, a way out of judgment. This is good. If you're not getting it yet, but this is good. Because we live so much in the religious law, but we need to live religiously for mercy. We need to get that change in our head. Verse 14, it says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if a man says he has faith but has no works? Can he save him? Can faith save him? Now, I want to talk about this a little bit because it changed our ability to look at faith when we operate in mercy because mercy takes action and mercy takes work, doesn't it? Because without mercy, everybody's going to feel judged. Without mercy, everybody's going to feel condemned. Without mercy, there is no freedom for those people. Amen? So mercy, if you don't have mercy, you have judgment because I guarantee you, if you don't have mercy for a heart of somebody, you're going to start judging them. So you've got to change, overchange your judgment to mercy. Amen? Your faith has to go back to Christ, and Christ is all about compassion and mercy. Amen? And so when you do that, you can actually follow these laws and these things that he wants to fulfill can start being fulfilled because now people have a chance to be fulfilled. Amen? Hmm. And verse, then it goes on, verse, I'll just read, can faith save him if there's no works? And it says, if, and if a brother or sister is naked and in lack daily food and one tells them, go in that place and be warm and be filled, go in peace, sorry, be warm and filled, and yet didn't give them anything, sorry, didn't give them the things of the body needs, what good is it? What good is your faith if there's no mercy? What good is your faith if there's not even enough mercy? If somebody comes to you <laughs> and, uh, and he says, well, I see you're struggling with that. Oh, I'm going to pray the peace of God over you. Hallelujah. Oh, be at peace. Let God bless you. And run away from that. I'm telling you, that's what we do. We often do that, don't we? Oh, if I could, yeah, man, I, I, I see you're suffering, but let me just bless you. Peace be to you, and we move on. I'm not, I'm not saying that you're always the one that has to do it, but I think we live in a society where we say that we want to help somebody, or we want to live in our faith, but we don't live it out. And we need to walk in that place. It says, it's so, what good is your faith if there's no action in your faith? Can you be saved without this? And it's talking about, can there be wholeness? There can't be wholeness without works. There can't be. Your body can't connect. The church can't connect without works. But faith has to come first before the works. Amen? You're not working for the sake of faith. You're working for faith that represents itself as works. Amen? Represents itself as, as deeds of God. It represents itself as Christians. It represents itself. It doesn't sit around... It actually represents itself. Amen? Then it goes on. I'm almost done here. Don't worry, guys. We're doing good. What good is it? Even so, and this is the scripture I'm going to start off with next, next Sunday. My next Sunday's message is, even so, faith, if it has no works, it's dead in itself. My title next Sunday is this, even so, it is lifeless in itself. That's my next sign. That's what dead means. It's lifeless in itself. What I'm trying to say is you have such richness, but it's lifeless if you don't use it. There's, there's no power in your faith if we don't walk in it. There's no power in it. You might have it, and you probably have it. You're born again. I'm not saying you're not, but it is dead here right now if we're not using it. We need to walk in it. Amen? Call the team up. We need to walk in it. We're going to do tithe right after the song and offering right after the song. But let's close off with uh, Galatians um, 6.2. Bear one another's burdens so that you are fulfilled in the law of Christ. Bear one another's burdens. Doesn't mean take over their burdens, but starting to help them carry their burdens. Amen? 
You fulfilled the law of Christ. How many want to fulfill the law of Christ today in the fullness of God? Amen.